Chronicle of the Times, Scandals of the Past, The Viscount and the Showgirl. Welcome to Chronicles of the Past. In today's episode, it is 1890. Lord Clancarty of Irish nobility has learned in the papers that his eldest son and heir, the Viscount Dunlow, aged 20, has secretly married a showgirl by the name of Belle Britton. Belle, considered an outstanding beauty, has an act on the stage with her sister where they sing, proclaiming that they are fresh, as fresh as the morning. Young Lord Dunlow has fallen head over heels for her, despite her rather dramatic past. A child, born of her father in prison, and another admirer who gives her a flat to use and protection. Lord Clancarty, upon hearing the news of his eldest son's marriage, goes into proxyisms of anger and makes it his mission to break up the relationship. We take a look at this singular case involving love, obsession, private investigators and a trial that was the talk of Great Britain. The Viscount and the Showgirl is today's episode of Scandals of the Past. We very much hope that you enjoy the show. We start with the background of the characters in this story. Viscount Dunlow, the eldest son of Lord Clancarty, at age 20, fell immediately in love with music hall star Belle Britton. Described by his own judicial team as possibly not being the brightest of lads, he was said to be a tall, slim young man with hair parted in the middle, a slightly prominent nose and a smooth face. His father, Lord Clancarty, had been disapproving for some time of the alleged bad company his son was keeping. He ensured that his son was kept on a short lead with a very small measure of monetary support. Lord Dunlow is described in the papers thus. From the Pall Mall Gazette, the 31st of July, 1890. Impressions of the Dunlow case. Lord Dunlow, the young gentleman whose folly brought about all the mischief, naturally deserves the first place. Freddy, as his wife affectionately addressed him, is a youth of one and twenty, tall, slim and beardless. He is, of course, elegantly attired in the latest fashion, but his frock coat does not hide, but rather enhances his awkwardness of gait. As to his intellect, his quality is sufficiently indicated by his deeds and by the fact that not even his counsel could suggest that he showed evidence of being endowed with high intellectual attainments of any kind. Lord Clancarty, married to Lady Georgina Hervey, with whom he had three children, William, Frederick, and Poetrench, or Freddy, as Belle called him, was his eldest, who went under the title of Viscount Dunlow. Lord Clancarty was famed for an explosive temper and seemed happiest when he had firm control over the members of his family. The papers are less than kind when describing him. From the Pall Mall Gazette, the 31st of July, 1890, Impressions of the Dunlow Case. Richard Somerset Le Poor Trench, Earl of Clancarty, the father of this young hopeful and the force behind the court case, who vainly attempted to get him out of his difficulty is a dark-haired, bronzed gentleman of fifty-six or thereabouts. He made but one appearance in Sir James Hannan's court and was in such bad health as to render it necessary that his evidence should be taken at once. 
His manner showed him to be utterly lacking in sympathy for his son's weakness, and there is little doubt that his evidence and the way in which it was given tended in no small degree to prejudice the petitioner's case. Bell Bilton, also Lady Dunlow. Bell, one half of the sisters Bilton, a duo who projected innocence on stage and made popular a chorus of the day. We're fresh, fresh as the morning, sweeter than new mown hay. Bell had met the young Viscount Dunlow, just twenty years old, at London's Corinthian Club in April 1889. The infamous club just off St James's Square attracted a wide range of upper-class young men and promised fun in the early hours, with a delightful absence of ceremony with respect to both sexes. Belle herself had had a troubled recent background. The daughter of a staff sergeant in the Royal Engineers, she had taken to the stage aged 14, and in 1887, just before she turned 21, had met an older married man by whom she had had a child. Seemingly respectable, he turned out to be a thoroughly bad lot and was convicted soon afterwards of being party to misappropriating £50,000, worth approximately £8 million in today's money, and jailed. The papers who seemed to back Bell from the start, for who does not like a story of a showgirl taking on the aristocracy, were kind regarding their descriptions of her. From the Pall Mall Gazette, 31st of July, 1890. Impressions of the Dunlow case. Lady Dunlow, who dressed in a quiet and ladylike fashion, entered the box and told her story like the utmost frankness. There was no hesitation of any kind, and whether the answer was likely to tell in her favour or not, it came with a promptitude which carried conviction to all who heard it. The last important figure in this case is the mysterious Mr Isidore Wertheimer, the man who also was madly in love with Belle Britain. Mr. Isidore Wertheimer, the man who would feature within the forthcoming case, was utterly enamoured with Belle. They first met at the Trocadero Club, and she confessed to him she was pregnant. He took a house for her in Maidenhead, where she lived under his protection, until her baby was born. Belle named him Isidore after her benefactor, but what happened to the child is unclear. She later met Dunlow, but kept up her acquaintance with Mr. Wertheimer. The papers had a favourable impression of the said fast Mr. Wertheimer, stating, Mr. Wertheimer also told his story without reserve, and it was this frankness as much as anything which successfully met the petitioner's case. Both parties were adamant that nothing whatever of an intimate nature had ever taken place between himself and Belle. He had asked her to marry him repeatedly, but she had refused. Even so, he kept close by her and did his best to protect her and support her. It is his support when she is abandoned that would become a crux of the case. The story begins with a newspaper article that is brought to the attention of Lord Plancarty. From the Pall Mall Gazette, the 16th of July, 1889, Lord Dunlow marries Miss Belle Bilton. A copy of the marriage certificate. Viscount Dunlow, the eldest son of the Earl of Clancarty, on Wednesday last, spent half an hour at the Hampstead Registry and during that time took unto himself in the bonds of matrimony 
Miss Belle Britton, the much photographed music hall artiste. This sprig of the Irish aristocracy, although he will not attain his majority until December, has been for some time past an ardent supporter of the many nightclubs which have sprung up recently. The Gardenia, the Corinthian and Evans all know him well, and it is these festive haunts that he has laid siege to the heart of the happy lady. Some few weeks back there were rumours of an impending action for breach in consequence of a letter written by the young gentleman, but matters were adjusted by the intervention of a friend, who until recently lived with the Viscount and some other chosen friends next door to the Corinthian Club in York Street, St James's Square. At any rate, on Wednesday morning, a bridal party consisting of the happy couple, Miss Flo Bilton, the bride's sister, and Mr Minshall Ford, ascended the hill which leads from Avenue Road to Hampstead and went through the interesting ceremony which has united a beauty of the halls to the future Earl of Clancarty. The appearance of Lady Dunlow is well known. His lordship is a tall, slim young man with hair parted in the middle and a slightly prominent nose and smooth face. The Viscount, accompanied by his tutor, will probably leave England for Australia in the course of a few days. The following is a copy of the marriage certificate. To say that Lord Clancarty exploded is quite possibly an understatement. His reaction is swift. He packs off his wayward son and the two lovers are separated after a week of married life. From the Pall Mall Gazette, 23rd of July, 1889. Theatrical Notes Lady Dunlow, knee Bilton, is still fulfilling her engagement at the Empire Theatre. Her husband, the Viscount, left London on Friday by the Orient S.S. Lusitania. His lordship, who is accompanied by a tutor, is bound for the Antipodes on a tour which, according to present arrangements, will last about two years. With the departure of his young wayward son, Lord Clancarty's mission is to find grounds for their divorce. This requires proof of Bell now. Lady Dunlow's adultery. With this in mind, he sets a team of private investigators on Bell to watch her every movement. With time, an erroneous picture is built of her having intimate relations with Mr. Wertheimer. With what they believe is proof, a letter is written to Lord Dunlow from the detectives. It paints a very bleak picture. From the Pall Mall Gazette, 28th of July, 1890, Mr Gill came to the circumstances under which the action for divorce was commenced. Who brought these proceedings, he asked. By way of answer, he read the letter from Mr George Lewis to Lord Dunlow, enclosing the petition for his signature. Dear Lord Dunlow, acting upon the instructions of your father and mother, I have caused a watch to be placed upon Lady Dunlow. The reports of the detectives have been submitted to your father and leave no doubt in my mind of the guilt of your wife with Mr. Wertheimer, who has been daily and hourly in her company since you left. You have had Time to think over your unfortunate marriage, and I hope that now you have seen how sad a step you took, having regard to the previous history of your wife. It is now open to you to do justice to yourself and to your family by taking proceedings for a divorce, and if you are prepared to follow the wishes of your family, I enclose a petition for your signature. Mr Gill went on to point out that it was about the strength of this letter 
that Lord Dunlow swore that his wife had continually and habitually committed a, a, adultery with the said Isidore Wertheimer at 63 Avenue Road at Bennett Street and diverse other places in the county of London. With the signature made, the court case against Lady Dunlow is set in motion. The case goes to trial as Dunlow versus Dunlow with co-respondent Wertheimer. The case is weak against Bell. Lord Clancarty for his son pays for four barristers in addition to the private detectives he had on the case, attempting to prove adultery on the part of Bell, thus ensuring a divorce between the two. From the Pall Mall Gazette, 23rd of July, 1890, hearing of the Dunlow divorce case, Lord Dunlow in the box. The hearing of the case of Dunlow versus Dunlow and Wertheimer was commenced before Sir James Hannan and a special jury this morning. This was an action for divorce brought by Viscount Dunlow on account of the alleged adultery of his wife, Lady Dunlow, formerly Miss Bell Bilton, a music hall singer, and Mr Isidore Wertheimer. The respondent in her pleadings denies the alleged adultery and states that there was connivance on the part of the husband if the alleged adultery took place. Sir Charles Russell, in opening the case for the petitioner, stated that his client was the eldest son of the Earl of Clancarty and attained his majority at the end of December 1889. He made the acquaintance of the respondent, formerly Belle Bitten, in May 1890, meeting her at several places, among others at the Corinthian Club. She was then living at 63 Avenue Road, St John's Wood, and Lord Dunlow visited her there. It was at this time the intention of his father, the Earl of Clancarty, to send his son, who he feared had got into a bad set in London, for a voyage around the world. When on the 15th of July the Earl of Clancarty read at the Carlton Club that his son had married a music hall singer, he was more than ever determined to send his son abroad. The marriage had taken place at a registry office on the 10th of July, and the petitioner and the respondent lived together at 63 Avenue Road until the 15th of July. And on the 19th of July, Viscount Dunlow sailed for foreign parts. Sir Charles Russell next entered into the history of Mr Wertheimer's connection with Miss Bell Bilton before her marriage. In July 1888, at a time where, when Walden, with whom she had previously lived, was in prison, the respondent, Lady Dunlow, and the co-respondent, Mr Wertheimer, became very intimate. She lived under his protection at Maidenhead, where she was delivered of a male child, which was registered as Isidore Alden Cleveland Weston. Mr. Wertheimer made arrangements for the accouchment, provided the physicians, and looked after the lady until she was restored to health. She then accompanied him to Trouville, whence they proceeded to the Hotel Dominique, in Paris. Wertheimer's friends endeavoured to get him out of the entanglement into which he had got, and in the middle of 1889 he was sent to America. While he was there, the marriage between Miss Belle Bilton and Viscount Dunlow took place. There could be no doubt, continued Sir Charles Russell, that Viscount Dunlow was very fond of the lady and when he parted from her in accordance with the peremptory demands of his father, it was a matter of very real grief to him. The letters written by him during the voyage were of an affectionate character, and her replies were also affectionate. She professed to describe with great frankness all her movements and proceedings, 
and referred to seeing Wertheimer in the street. All this time, the old relations between the two were, in point of fact, renewed. They spent their time in one another's company. He shadowed her wherever she went, and he waited for her at the stage door of the music halls at which she sang. There was only one exception. They did not sleep under the same roof. When this condition of things came to the knowledge of Lord Clancarty's legal advisers, the pair were watched, and, as a result, Lord Dunlow was asked to sign a petition for divorce. This, with great reluctance and after considerable delay, he consented to do. A strong opening by the prosecution team, but this was possibly the best thing ever for the prosecution team in the trial. Lord Dunlow himself is called to the stand. His heart is not in the proceedings against his wife, clearly. Lord Dunlow's evidence. Lord Dunlow was then called and examined. Lord Dunlow, a tall, youthful-looking gentleman, said that he was the eldest son of Lord Fancarty. He first met Miss Bell Bilton on April the 11th, 1889, at which time she was singing at the Empire Theatre. An intimacy sprang up between them, and he visited her at Avenue Road, but he never slept there. He married her on July the 10th, his father having previously made arrangements for his going abroad with Mr. Robertson, a tutor. After his marriage, he lived with Lady Dunlow at the Victoria Hotel until July the 19th, when he went abroad with Mr. Robertson. He had no means independently of what his father allowed him. His wife and her sister earned something like £1,500 a year, worth approximately 240000 a year in 2024. And when he left England, it was with the intention of living with his wife when he came back, and he told her so. A long correspondence between Viscount Dunlow and his wife was then read. The first letter was written from the Victoria Hotel on the day that Viscount Dunlow left England. In it, Lady Dunlow said she was broken-hearted at his leaving, and signed herself your broken-hearted wife, Bella. In the next letter, she said that a friend had congratulated her on her marriage and had told her to be careful with what she did. To one of these letters, Lord Dunlow replied as follows, My own, own darling wife, I shall post this letter at Gibraltar, at which place we shall arrive tomorrow at eight o'clock. I got yours, my darling, at Plymouth. My girl, I will ever be true to you. I shall return to you in December, and we shall always be together. I shall always be very unhappy until I return. I am so glad you have got rooms, and I hope they're nice. Isidore must be a curious man. I shall be interested in meeting him. I am sorry he is broken-hearted, but it is the fortune of war, and I am glad that I am the lucky fellow. Lady Dunlow is brought to testify. It was remarked by all her calm and grace under pressure. She came across as an innocent who had to expend much energy to protect herself from unwanted attention and who had been taken advantage of at a young age. The crowd within the court, as well as the judge, were very sympathetic to her. From the Pall Mall Gazette, 29th of July, 1890, the Dunlow divorce case, Lady Dunlow's cross-examination. Sir James Hannan and a special jury resumed their hearing of the Dunlow divorce case this morning. The case, which has already occupied the court for four days, is one in which Lord Dunlow, the eldest son of the Earl of Clancarty, prays for a dissolution of his marriage on the grounds 
of Lady Dunlow's alleged adultery with Mr. Isidore Wertheimer, the son of a Bond Street dealer in bric-a-brac. There was the usual rush for seats, but thanks to Sir James Hannan, those connected with the case were spared the inconvenience of a crowded court. The judge having taken his seat, Lady Dunlow's cross-examination at the hands of Sir Charles Russell was at once resumed. Lady Dunlow said that Mr. Wertheimer told her that he had been removed from his position in his father's firm. He did not say that he had been removed from the firm on account of his supposed connection with her. He said his people wanted him to travel, and he started upon a tour similar to that taken by Lord Dunlow. Before he left, he took 63 Avenue Road, furnished it for her, and made her a present of it. This was in January 1889. She was not aware that he executed any formal transfer of it. At least he had never handed her any such deed. Mr. Wertheimer did not live at 63 Avenue Road. He sometimes slept there twice a week, perhaps. At that time he lived at home, but the house was his, and he asked that he might have a bedroom there. A series of questions are asked of Lady Dunlow. Now, you have seen a good deal of the world, and I am sorry to have to put it to you, you know what a man keeping a mistress is? Yes. Now, in what respect did your position differ from that of a kept mistress? Why, I was nothing to him. But so far as the world was concerned, everyone who knew us knew it was not the case. While Wertheimer was away, she both wrote and telegraphed to him. He also wrote and telegraphed to her, but neither his letters nor his telegrams were preserved. She always burnt them upon receiving them. She had never seen Lord Dunlow before she met him at the Corinthian Club. At that time she was living at 63 Avenue Road, had four horses, a well-furnished house and servants, all of which belonged to Mr. Wertheimer. She was also receiving considerable checks from Mr. Wersheimer. Did you invite Lord Dunlow to visit you at 63 Avenue Road? No, he called with a Mr. Clifton. Afterwards he visited you often and stayed very late. He used to bring me home, but he did not stay very late. He once brought me home at half past three and stayed till four. When did he propose marriage to you? in May. Did you accept him? No, not at first. I said his father would not allow him to marry me. She saw the statement in the star that she had lived at Maidenhead under the protection of a Mr. Wertheimer, but she did not understand that it meant that she had been Wertheimer's mistress. Lord Dunlow told her that his father proposed sending him away before they were married. Wertheimer often offered to marry her, and she had as often definitely refused him. She had told him that she would never marry him. She early became aware that she was watched by detectives. She took pains never to be alone with Wertheimer, so that people should not be able to talk. The defence ends with a flourish. Lady Dunlow, Lord Dunlow and Mr Wertheimer all come across well within the trial in comparison to Lord Clancarty and the detectives. From the Pall Mall Gazette, the 28th of July, 1890, the Dunlow divorce case, fourth day. Mr. Gill then resumed his speech on behalf of Mr. Wertheimer, criticising at length the evidence adduced to by Sir Charles Russell in support of his case. It was true, he said, 
that the same relations existed between Mr. Wertheimer and Lady Dunlow after her marriage as before, because she never did at any time occupy toward him the position of a mistress. No doubt the jury would be invited as men of the world to say that no man could be sufficiently chivalrous to act as Mr. Wertheimer did without receiving some return for it. Surely it was not possible for a man to assist a woman in difficulties without having guilty relations with her. Mr. Wertheimer would tell them that all this time he had the greatest admiration for the respondent and wished to marry her, and that, that he hoped that in time she would consent to accept him. With the verdict for Bell, the papers cheer as this being a case where the common man won over the aristocracy. It is considered a coup, and Bell, whose fame was already very high, is launched into super stardom with offers from music halls of £150 a week, worth approximately £25,000 in 2024. Lord Clancarty has done everything in his power to get rid of her, and after a six-day trial, Lady Dunlow was found not guilty of adultery, with the marriage thereby standing. As she walked out of the courtroom, hats and handkerchiefs were thrown into the air with shouts of Hurrah! Belle herself celebrates her win in an appropriate style on the stage. From the Pall Mall Gazette, 31st of July, 1890, the Dunlow case, music hall verdict. The appearance of Miss Florence Bilton, the sister of Lady Dunlow last night at a West End place of entertainment, was selected as the fitting opportunity for immaculate masterdom to vent its feelings in pronounced and riotous exuberant fashion. Even before the curtain went up for the fair lady's turn, the ardent sympathy of the audience could not be suppressed, and when the number was placed in the case at the side of the stage, indicating that the popular serial comic was positively about to enter, rapturous cheering broke out. The moment Miss Bilton bounced onto the stage, the White Shirt Brigade, the Shilling Balcony and the Plebeian Sixpency Pit vied in their demonstrations of welcome. By accident or design, the fair enchantress selected for performance a chaste and intellectual ballad with the appropriate refrain he lost it, and the subtlety of the suggestion was not lost upon the clamorous assembly. Another reference to a gentleman who was sorry he got married was likewise treated in a double sense, and finally, when the lady had danced a sprightly measure, the curtain came down amidst delighted assurances of he's lost it from emotional sympathisers. As Lord Clancarty hides himself away, the Lord and Lady Dunlow favour the Irish Times with a joint interview. From the Pall Mall Gazette, the 4th of August, 1890, Lord and Lady Dunlow, a reconciliation. In an interview with a representative of the Irish Times at Dublin yesterday, Lady Dunlow stated that since the trial, Lord Dunlow had called on Mr. Wertheimer and assured him that he did not bear him any ill will, and expressed a hope that Mr. Wertheimer would forgive him for having dragged him into the recent proceedings. He regretted the whole matter very much, and he asked Mr. Wertheimer to make friends with him. Mr. Wertheimer met Lord Dunlow in the same spirit, and Lord Dunlow, having expressed a wish to see her, it was arranged that they should meet at the Café Royal and have luncheon together. Accordingly, they met there, and Lord Dunlow expressed his regret that the action had ever been brought, and said that, as for the part that he took in it, 
he really was forced into it. The result was that they made up their difference and subsequently dined together, the party including Mr. Harris. On Saturday night, they occupied a box at the Comedy Theatre and subsequently Mr. Harris entertained them at supper at the Continental. Lady Dunlow then said with much earnestness, I am very happy at the result of the trial. I knew that I was going to win. Lord Dunlow is delighted with the verdict and he is coming over here and will be here on Wednesday. To the question whether Lord Dunlow approved of her remaining on the stage, Lady Dunlow said he would like her to retire from it, but she was unwilling to do so. Mr Harris observed that Lady Dunlow liked her profession and was really a student and now desired to occupy a position on the stage different from that which she had previously held. She would not again appear in music halls. She understood from Lord Dunlow that Lord Clancarty wanted him to go to South Africa and intimated that he would make him a good allowance. Lord Dunlow asked her to accompany him, but she was unwilling to do so, as she believed she would not achieve success in her profession, and she had now an engagement with Mr Harris for two years. Lord Clancarty continued to wield his power over his son and sent him to Australia, once again separating the two lovers. From the Pall Mall Gazette, the 21st of October, 1889, the marriage of the Viscount Dunlow. Viscount Dunlow, whose marriage to a music hall beauty was a nine days wonder last August, has arrived in Australia under the charge of a tutor. In the intervals of study, pretty long ones too, he patronised the colonial racehorses and takes a keen interest in the workings of the totalizer. The colonial reporters do not give a very flattering portrait of his juvenile lordship. They sum him up as a tall young man with a rather a weak cast of features, the mouth in particular being markedly irresolute. Lady Dunlow did indeed eventually become the Countess Dunlow, but the marriage was an unhappy one. Belle was never truly accepted into Irish high society with her scandalous past and her illegitimate child. Belle, for her part, struggled with the quiet, sedentary pace of country island and longed for the excitement of the stage, an impossibility as a countess. Two years after the court case, her husband succeeded his father, becoming the fifth Earl of Clancarty. She became the Countess of Clancarty. The couple had five children, including the sixth and seventh Earls of Clancarty. She died of cancer on the 31st of December 1906 at Garbaldi Park in Banislow, County Galway, in Ireland. That concludes this episode of Scandals of the Past. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, we would be really grateful if you'd like and subscribe to our channel. The likes and subscribes help us to keep our small channel alive. Do be sure to check out our community posts on our channel page every Sunday which will tell you what episodes are coming up the following week. And if you have a liking for the darker sides of Georgian, Victorian and Edwardian stories, check out our original sister channel, News of the Times. The link is on our channel page and below. Thank you again, everyone. See you next time. This has been Chronicle of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.